عليه وسلم اللهم صل على محمد يا رب صل عليه وسلم اللهم صل على محمد يا رب صل عليه وسلم اللهم صل على محمد يا رب صل عليه وسلم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد فالسلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته الحمد لله ثم الحمد لله All thanks and praises are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We are extremely honored today with a beautiful guest That is awaiting inshallah for us just to calm down a bit But before we introduce our guest I would like to welcome everybody And inshallah ta'ala we have our very own radio station with us today the voice of the cape mashallah may allah bless them inshallah take our radio radio station to grow from strength to strength as they take out of their precious time to be present with us today inshallah ta'ala so bi idnillah may allah bless them and now we introduce our guest of honor for today we have none other than mufni mufti ismail mink mashallah who hails from all the way from zimbabwe but uh, we all know that mufti is a cape townian Mufti is known to be a Kryptonian, mashallah. May Allah bless Mufti, his presence here. We can see his overwhelming presence, alhamdulillah, here. It teaches us a lot. Somebody that is doing so much da'wah, right, globally, alhamdulillah. And many people benefit from him. Today, we have that honor to benefit from Mufti, inshallah. So we urge everybody, inshallah, to listen attentively. And may Allah allow Mufti's tongue to be loose, inshallah ta'ala, for him to inspire us as inspire many around the globe. And inshallah ta'ala, as we walk away here today, we'll be different Muslims. Muslims. Our spirituality will be, inshallah, on such a height that we will, inshallah, live for Allah and His, his, and his Nabi Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. As we know that we have somebody here that love Allah and His Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So, Mufti, if Mufti is ready, you can see Mufti is the speaker, but Mufti is also the one that's controlling everything. Amazing for me to learn, subhanallah. May Allah bless Mufti, inshallah, taala. Barakallahu fiikum, inshallah, taala fal yatafadl mashkura, ya ustad. to go 10 times higher Habibi <laughs> just ask Uncle Siraj Parker to sort it out inshallah <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Bismillahi wa alhamdulillahi wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in my beloved brothers, my sisters, every one of us wants goodness in this world and we as believers would like goodness in the hereafter too. I want to start with a question, which is more important, the goodness of this world or the goodness of the next? There's a lot of uh, dilly-dallying in that answer. This world or the next, which one is more important? The next one, subhanallah rabbil alameen. That means that while we are on earth, we would be part of the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are and Allah expects us to lead our lives in a certain way. But no matter what happens on earth, for as long as you and I were within the obedience of Allah, trying our best by the will and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will be achieving the goodness of the hereafter. Allah did not guarantee anyone that they would have everything their way in this world because then what was the point of promising you a life after death wherein you would go to a paradise where everything would be your way when already on earth it was your way. For that reason, nobody has it their way on earth. It is Allah's way. That's how it is. May Allah Almighty grant us ease and goodness. We have the best of creation, the most noble of all messengers of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. The closest to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. If anyone had the ease of this world, would it not have been him who deserves it the most? Yet Allah Almighty 
placed him on earth at a time where technology was not as advanced as it is for you and I today. At that time, there was no electricity. At that time, there was no running water from a tap. At that time, there were no mobile phones or internet or aircraft or even motor vehicles for that matter. Yet he was the most deserving of every goodness of this world. He was the most deserving of everything. And Allah gave him as much as Allah wanted to give him. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, you and I know without a doubt, Afdalul Khalqi wa Akramul Rusuli. Salawatu Rabbi wa Salamuhu alayhi. The most noble of all prophets, the greatest of all of us all. So that goes to prove that the happiness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a person is not connected to how much you have. It's connected to the contentment that Allah gives you and the conviction in your heart that Allah loves you enough. No matter what challenges you are going through and you will go through challenge upon challenge. Today on earth, many of us are struggling with what? Unemployment, inflation, the rand is crashing as I breathe, subhanallah. Let me pause, stop breathing for a moment. We'll help the rand. Yes, that's just one example. We're hoping after Hajj, it will actually go the other way. Inshallah, it will strengthen. They say when the Hajis make dua, you watch, go back. They say the rand starts strengthening. What happened in Arafah? Oh Allah, strengthen the rand. Oh Allah, strengthen the rand. South Africans, Allahu Akbar. May Allah make it easy for us. But my brothers and sisters, on a more serious note, the challenges we face are real. Many have health matters and problems. Many cannot afford food or drink. Many cannot pay rent. Many cannot pay the bills. Many cannot pay school fees. Is that not a real problem? Wallahi, these are minor temporary issues of the dunya. They are of the world for Allah Almighty to solve that matter is a, f a flash. Before that flash, the matter will be solved. May Allah grant us ease. Ask Allah to grant you ease enough to be able to continue into the hereafter with his pleasure. Ask Allah to give you enough of the world that he can remain or continue to be pleased with you throughout your journey until you meet with him. The Prophet ﷺ used to say, Allahumma ahyini ma kanatil hayatu khayran li. Oh Allah, keep me alive for as long as life is better for me. Oh Allah, take me away when you know it's better for me to go. Subhanallah. Another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, none of you should wish for death in order to come out of a problem or a difficulty or hardship that you have on earth. Consider it a gift of Allah. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. سبحان الله. Allah says, Allah does not burden any soul beyond what it can take. Beyond what you can take, Allah will not burden you. So if Allah has burdened you, you can take it. If you're not managing, turn to Allah. Seek help. Do the right things. How do I seek help? Number one, build a connection with Allah. How do I build a connection with Allah? Your salah is extremely important. If you don't have five salah and you're complaining about a problem that you're in, you haven't even started with a cough mixture for your cough complaining about a cough when you don't understand the first thing you need is a little bit of medication if you're a person who believes in home remedies like i do you would start with warm water salt gardens Watch one does my you guys are laughing great remember me my brothers my sisters the beginning of the remedy is connection with allah what will it do for you it give you
We are close on to Eid al-Adha. Few days remaining. It is the need of the sacrifice. Eid is a day of joy and happiness and sacrifice. It's some difficulty and hardship, isn't it? Look at the two coming together. You sacrifice, you deserve an Eid. You sacrifice, you deserve joy. In the same way, the sacrifice every year is celebrated with an Eid. The sacrifice of your life will be celebrated with Jannah. So don't think that it's going to be a walk in the park. May Allah Almighty make it easy for us. My brothers and sisters, you have to face challenges. Every year, you have to have some form of a sickness, light or heavy. You have the annual flu. What happens? You have to. Have a cough. No matter how pious you are, there will be something in your health that goes up and down almost every year. Body you shall be nourished in a way that it will be blessed with a perfect body very soon after this imperfect body is separated from us. We look at ourselves in the mirror, Wallahi, we notice one hair. If that is the level of scrutiny of this imperfect body that we've been given as an amana in this world temporarily, can you imagine sacrifice for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? with leathat al-ibadah the sweetness of worship of Allah while I'm on earth oh Allah grant me the sweetness of worshiping you and you alone so that I can get up in salah and enjoy the prayer 
How many times we get up in prayer in this world, we will never be able to do exactly the same in the hereafter if we didn't do it here. We didn't engage in sujood here. How do you expect to engage in sujood there? So Allah Almighty tells us to make this dua, to grant us goodness in this world. What is the goodness? Number one, the joy of worshiping my maker to guide me to the deen. Do you know which statement has been said the most on earth from the beginning to the end without a debate and without an argument? I'm going to tell it to you. There is a certain statement uttered by human beings that has been repeated the most on earth as compared to any other statement uttered by humankind. What is it? Do you know what it is? Can anyone tell me maybe? Allahu Akbar. That's the term. Allah is the greatest. How many Muslims are there on earth today? Perhaps two billion. How many prayers a day? Five daily prayers. Farad. How many times do you move in Salah? How many times do you repeat Allahu Akbar? How many times Adhan is called? How many Allahu Akbars in Adhan? How many times the Iqama or Takbir for Salah is called? How many times is the Allahu Akbar in that statement? So every day there are billions of times of the repetition of the statement Allahu Akbar, there is no other statement from the beginning of the creation of Adam right up to this day that was ever and shall ever be repeated more than Allahu Akbar. It's impossible. Allahu Akbar. There goes. Have you ever thought about it? And then another question I have, which is the dua that you and I ask for the most? The most repeated supplication that you've ever asked for. There is no supplication that you and I have repeated more than that. Every time you read Surah Al-Fatiha, you're saying, guide us to the straight path. Guide us to the straight path. What do I learn from this? On earth, we need to understand the biggest blessing of Allah is for someone to realize and to believe that Allah is the greatest and to continue believing that guidance is in the hands of Allah. So he or she continues to ask Allah for guidance. May Allah guide us. What a gift. What a powerful gift. So now if you're asking for something every single day, you're asking to pass a test, for example, Oh Allah, I'm writing my matric. May Allah make it easy for those who are about to write. I'm sure there's about a few months remaining. Agreed? Guys are writing matric soon. And in other countries, they call it O level, A level, whatever else it might be. It's fine. But imagine you ask Allah, Oh Allah, grant me the ability to pass. Help me to pass. Help me to pass. But you're not reading a book. You're not going to school. You're not doing anything about it. What do you expect? An angel is going to come and tell you all the answers. <laughs> Subhanallah, you'll be sitting and waiting. The angel, angel, where's the angel? He didn't come. You were a fool because you didn't make an effort towards what you asked Allah for. You've got to make an effort. You say, oh Allah, help me to get to the masjid, but you're sleeping. But you think someone's going to come and pick you up and drop you into the masjid just from your bed. You need to make a little effort at least and you need to get up and you need to perhaps make wudu either call someone or do something about it, then Allah will make it easier for you to get there. The same applies when you ask Allah guidance every day. Guidance is there. Are you making an effort to achieve the guidance or is it just a dua that you don't even realize you're making? May Allah grant us that guidance. One of the best ways of looking at it is just to look at the five daily prayers. You see, when you look at the pillars of Islam, it's another amazing fact. The first pillar of Islam, the Shahada, the two Shahadas. We believe in Allah and worship Him alone. And we believe there is none worthy of worship besides Him. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the messenger and the final messenger. Shahada. Now, that is repeated every day and it actually makes up every aspect of your life. Let's get to the next pillar. You have Salah. That's just five times a day. That's compulsory. You can add some sunnah and nafil and so on, but five times a day is compulsory. We get to the next pillar. What is it? Zakah. 
You take from your wealth, you give the poor. You notice how the first one is the most important one, although they are all pillars. The second one is the next most important. Subhanallah. The third one, why is it third in order? Because it's not everyone who's going to pay zakah. Not everyone is going to pay it. You know why? Because if you take a careful look, zakah is only incumbent compulsory upon those who have a certain amount of wealth. It's only compulsory upon those who have a certain amount of wealth. If you don't, it's not compulsory. Subhanallah. So that's the next pillar of Islam. But you can still give a charity. Even if zakat is not compulsory on you, you give. You see, two and a half percent belongs to Allah. But what have you given? So someone says, what's that question all about? I don't understand it. Let me explain it to you. Allah says, for every hundred, two and a half is mine, 97 and a half is yours. So for you to just put it in the right place, you're getting a reward for fulfilling it. It doesn't belong to you. If you've eaten it, you've stolen it. It belongs to Allah. He'll take it from you, hook or crook. What that means is, well, he'll take it from you anyhow. That's what we mean. You either get sick or ill or you suffer a loss or something happens and that money is gone. Your zakat is still not done, but that money went out of your system. The verses of zakat. Allah says, take from their wealth the zakah that will cleanse them. It will purify them. Because when you are too attached to that wealth, you know what happens? You become attached to this world. The greed overtakes you. When greed overtakes you, you become a person who wants everything in the world, forgetting that I'm going to the hereafter. Actually, my palace in this world may be built by money, but my more important palace in the hereafter is going to be built by how much that, how much I've given away and how kind and good I was and how much I worshipped Allah. So if I build someone else's life, Allah builds mine in the hereafter. But when I build my own here, it's not like I'm building anything besides what I'm doing on earth. It's going to help me for a few years. Many of us, first home that they ever owned. And that's from among those who own homes. If I were to ask you, and I don't want to ask you, but if I were to ask you, how many of you have your own homes in your own names? It's a minority. Most of us live in rented accommodation. It would be a dream. If I asked you, how old are you? You would say 65. We're paying rent still. Or staying in my father's house. Agreed. Yes, it's a fact. So that house, even if Allah gave you the wealth to actually buy it, how many years will it help you? Your kids will be living in it, say, this is my dad's house. But where's dad? Oh, he passed away a few years ago. But dad worked for how many years? He worked for 60 years before he paid up the house. Right? What about the house of the hereafter? It takes you a lifetime to build it. It takes you a lifetime to build it. And the beauty of those payments is sometimes they are just in the form of repentance. Subhanallah. You committed a sin and another sin and a bigger sin and an even bigger sin and a major sin and a massive sin. And then you said, oh Allah, forgive me. I truly regret. I repent. I shouldn't have done this. It was wrong. I don't want to defy you and I will not. And I ask you for forgiveness. Forgive me. That statement can start building your hereafter. It will start building your palace. Shaitan will come to you and tell you, no, do you think it's that easy to get forgiven by Allah? No, that's Shaitan. Allah says it is even easier than that to be forgiven by Allah. At times you do something and you don't even know you have not sought the forgiveness from it. But because it was a minor sin, the goodness that you did after that automatically wiped it out. In al hasanati yudhibn as sayyiat. The good deeds automatically wipe out the minor sins, the bad deeds. This is Allah. So Allah Almighty loves us enough to forgive us. Not just when we seek forgiveness, but when we do good deeds as well. So that's the next thing you need to do to build that palace. Start doing good deeds. What are good deeds? Wallahi, I told you about the five daily prayers. Start off with it. Be strong. Fight yourself. Fight your nafs. Don't be lazy. If you miss because you are just starting to become regular, pray it in the evening. As soon as you remember, as soon as you can, do it. 
even if it is Kaaba initially, and I'm talking to people whom perhaps may be struggling to come upon the five salah. We believe and we should be doing it. But I know from amongst us, because of the environment and the challenges of the globe, many people are not regular with their prayers. That's the reason why I'm talking on this level. I know people argue with me, Sheikh, how could you even compromise on the five? We're not compromising. We're helping people who might be struggling with it. That's all we're doing. I was telling you about the zakah, right? Two and a half percent belongs to Allah. Now let's look at you. What are you going to give after that? It's called a sadaqah, a charity. That's it. In some circles, they call it a lillah. I'm just giving this for Allah. Not like the others is not for Allah, but it's just in some circles, that's what they call it. It's actually a broader voluntary sadaqah. That's what it is. How much are you going to give? Are you prepared to put your hand in your pocket and to give? When Allah says, Anfiqi abna Adam, unfiq alayk. Spend, O oh son of Adam, I will spend on you. Give, I'll give you. Are you going to trust me enough to put your hand in your pocket and give when you see a need more than yours? And you are in need because we're all in need. I'm in need. Subhanallah. Are you going to give? Are you going to take out and put? You're going to send home for your family, for your relatives, for someone who's asked. I'm talking of home, meaning wherever you might be living in another city or another country, wherever it may be. You give those you know, those you don't know. Subhanallah. You see the beggars, when you see a beggar coming and asking. It's a very interesting point. I mentioned it last night. Allah did not say give the beggar. Allah says, the, as for the beggar, do not rebuke him. Don't belittle him. Don't insult him. That's all. Allah didn't say give him. Because Allah Almighty doesn't want you to beg. Right? But begging is the last option of some people. Right? May Allah strengthen us and strengthen them and grant them so that they can also give others. But, As for the one who's asking, don't rebuke. We created the need in the people so that you could fulfill an act of worship known as giving to the poor. They could be such need that by you giving, you're building your paradise. By you giving, you're building your paradise. So why rebuke? Why do it? We see social experiments nowadays on social media where people uh, are wealthy, but they're pretending to beg just to take a video to show you how people are. People don't give. And sometimes when they insult, it becomes even worse. Don't insult. If you don't want, leave it. But the point is, the more you give, the more you will get. That is guaranteed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obviously, your basic necessity, generally, you don't give that away. You can't take off your shirt and say, right here, take it. You can't take off something that you're wearing, covering yourself and say, right, take this, take that. You need that. That's a basic need, you see. But just beyond your basic need, you can give and you should give. And the more you give, the more you will get. And the minimum is respect the person. Because do you know what? If Allah wanted, Allah could have fulfilled that person's need without you and I. And we're all in need. We all ask Allah. We're all crying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When is the best time to cry to Allah? Tahajjud. Wallahi, you're right. We are taught that tahajjud is by invite only. So you don't just get up for tahajjud. You are invited to get up by Allah. So if you are up for tahajjud, thank Allah because he's invited you and he's honored you to get up and you're there. That's an invite. You're invited. Tahajjud is by invite only. It's not possible for you and I to just get up and start doing tahajjud. No, 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 no. It is by the invite of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And out of his love, he creates a need in your life in order for you to get up for that tahajjud. That was the invitation. It came to you through a difficulty, through a hardship. You never ever tasted the sweetness of tahajjud until you had a challenge that you felt nobody can solve and resolve. Now you got up and you're crying. Allah says, I love you so much. Look at you. You've come to me. You are broken. You are softened. You're worshipping me. You're asking me. Just that much is building your paradise. Whether Allah gave you what you wanted on earth or not is irrelevant. Do you agree? 
If Allah loves me because I got up for tahajjud and I cried and I wept for my needs and he knew he was not going to give me the needs but he knows that because of such a powerful, sincere, genuine act of worship and such lovely, beautiful, sincere, warm tears rolling down your cheeks because of that, I'm going to give this person paradise. Do you really mind whether or not he gives you what you were actually asking for if it was related to this world? I don't care. Do you get what I'm saying? Didn't I start off by asking you a question, which is more important? And don't lie, you guys were dilly-dallying with that answer. <laughs> but the reason I asked it was to get back to it all the time, to tell you, you know what, this world, you're going to cry, you're going to do things, you're going to have hardship, difficulty, whatever it may be. But Allah Almighty knows when you process it the right way, you have the best of this world. What is the best of this world? Is the best of this world not including the tahajjud? Is the best of this world not including the dua to Allah? Is the best of this world not the connection with Allah? Is that not the best of this world? Yes, but over and above that, because I'm a human, I also want a little bit of comfort on earth. May Allah grant us good jobs and good income. May Allah Almighty provide us with sustenance so that we don't depend on anyone but Him. That Amin was very loud. Did you notice? <laughs> Subhanallah, Rabbil Al. It's important. It's important. We are Muslims. We are honored. We are taught to strike a balance. It's not correct for you to divorce yourself from the earth because you also need to get married. May Allah make it easy for those who are not married to get married. Amen. All the married guys are saying Amin. <laughs> All the married guys are saying Amin. You guys better be careful, man. Mashallah. Well, we're saying Amin for those who need to get married, inshallah. <laughs> Sheikh, don't hold it against me, Sheikh. <laughs> mashallah. You might have other plans. But it's true, you want to get married and you want to look after your children, your spouse, your family members, you want to create a little bit of comfort for them. Many parents, you ask them, why are you earning? Say, for my kids. You know, a little bit for myself, but more so for my kids. I'm going to do this for my child and that for my child. Wallahi, do you really think Allah who created you and your father is going to abandon you? But Allah tells you, oh son of Adam, adjust to the level I've kept you on. Be happy. I've kept you on a level. Don't look at those who have more in terms of worldly belongings because you won't be able to appreciate what you have. Rather look at those who have less so that you can say, I'm favored by Allah. That's what Allah tells you. The problem with today's world that is filled with social media is comparison. Comparison. You see someone who's showing you something they don't have, pretending like they have it, and through that pretense, your life has become a misery. Because you don't know their life is already a misery. It's photoshopped. And not only that, it's artificial intelligence and whatever else it may be. You are thinking they have the happiness that you are looking at them and believing they have it and they are desperately looking at your real life and hoping that they could have yours. And you are so depressed because you think that they have what they don't have that you want. Allahu Akbar, so complicated, so confusing, but that's the life. So don't compare. What you see on social media stays on social media. It doesn't come into your heart and your system. You see, the comparisons. People show you they're driving a Lamborghini. I promise you, sometimes it's not even a Lamborghini. It's called a green screen. Ask me. Yes, it is. You know what's a green screen? If you don't know, find out. <laughs> Only problem is you might become one of those, you know. But it's a fact. They're showing you something that's non-existent. Don't be depressed. Allah has given you the best of this world. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to crush the enemy in Ta'if, wallahi, he, he chose not to. You and I, you have a problem with your blood brother. Oh Allah, destroy him, break him, finish him. Or, you know, make sure that he doesn't ever come up again. Finish him up. That's your brother. Which Nabi are you following by the way? 
Which prophet are you proud of and you following? Who's your Nabi? Are you going to follow him to say, Oh Allah, soften his heart? I have a problem. We are going to try and sort it out. I'm going to do this and that. Oh Allah, soften his heart. Soften our hearts. Make an attempt once, twice, ten times. He doesn't want to talk to you. She doesn't want to talk to you. Your brother, your sister, whoever it may be, your uncle, your aunt, your in laws, your outlaws, all of those. Are you going to try? Are you going to try? If you're going to try, Wallahi, you, your trial is your paradise. That's what you forget about. What's going to happen? I don't know. Allah knows. Did I try twice, thrice? He swore me. He insulted me. No problem. That's my brother. I'm going to try again. And you solve the problem. I'm not saying that just give up to injustice in a way that is going to be repeated again and again and again. I mean, every time you meet him, he hits you with a rod. It doesn't mean you must go back and try. He'll hit you again with a rod, my brother. What we mean is common logic and common sense. So my brothers, my sisters, take a look at what is the best of this world. You already have it. Subhanallah. You already have it. Don't you have the deen of Allah? Aren't you in the house of Allah? Didn't you just fulfill salah? Didn't Allah Almighty say through the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, The closest that a slave is to his Lord is when he's in prostration. Didn't you prostrate just now? Is that not the closest posture and position you can ever get to? To Allah. Subhanallah. You have something moving for you, man. Are we not eating and drinking no matter what the condition is of the food? As long as it's halal, it's good. If a man is eating for 50 rands or 25 rands, Wallahi, he'll fill his belly perhaps sometimes better and more than those who go for fine dining. You know what's fine dining? 500 rands and they give you one prawn. <laughs> I promise you. <laughs> and, and they put a little design of avocado sauce around there. And you look at it, you say, where did my money go? I'd rather go for the pup and vegetable that they give for 10 rands down the road. <laughs> Do you understand what I mean? So it's all relative. It's all relative. May Allah Almighty grant us goodness and ease. May Allah open our doors. You have the best. You have the goodness of this world if you have the deen of Allah. But work hard to achieve that which will benefit you on earth. You want to buy a house. You want to buy a car. You want to have good things. You must get up in the morning. Number one, salah. Number two, you must make sure that you go to work. You don't have a job. Look for a job. How long for? For as long as it takes, don't, don't give up. I know people who've looked for a job for six years. A guy that I know looked for a job for six whole years. And we kept telling him, don't lose hope. He said, come on, don't lose hope up to when? He said, well, whatever long it takes, however long it takes. He ended up buying and selling things. Trust me, he became a millionaire. Last year he told me, I made my first million. Allah, Allah yazidana jami'an ya shaykh. May Allah grant all of us goodness. No, those millions were not Zimbabwean dollars, by the way. Eh? <laughs> the whole world knows about Zimbabwe. <laughs> but I tell you, my brothers and sisters, what is the moral of it? Sometimes Allah stretches and prolongs your desperation and your need because he wants you to continue crying to him calling he loved you that way it changed you it made you a better person six years was enough we became people who are regular with salah we changed our lives we cut our sons we we spent more time with our families subhanallah when allah gives you the feeling within your heart that you need to spend time with your family it's a sign that you have the best of this world one of the signs and when Allah Almighty has not accepted you, shaitan gets hold of you and makes you feel that you need to spend time with haram, with that which is displeasing to Allah, then you're losing the best of this world. You can never achieve the best of this world through haram. That contentment, you lose it. So this brother got a job after so many years and he says, I'm so thankful to Allah because one thing led to another, to a third, to a fourth. Now I'm my own boss. I don't even have a time that I need to get to a workplace at a certain time from this time to that time. And I'm so thankful to Allah. And guess what? The ball is rolling. I told him, what exactly do you do? He said, I'm not selling my secrets. I said, wise man, for as long as halal, I don't care. I don't need to know. It's not wise to tell everyone what you do because a lot of time, the times shaitan will come and make them do what you're doing better than you, subhanallah. <laughs> and who told them? But you can share with them the profit of what you're making, isn't it? 
Tell him, listen, I won't tell you what I'm doing, but I'll give you 10 grand every month. <laughs> that's a sharp guy. I tell you, that's an intelligent man. <laughs> if only but you know. Someone might come to me outside there and say, where's the 10 grand? Let's see it. <laughs> Don't despair. The challenges that you face on earth are temporary, my brothers and sisters. Wallahi, they are temporary. How many of us have been through days we believe we're not going to make it out, either because of a financial struggle, family matter, a health matter, whatever else it may be. Today we're standing and we're happy. And we're okay. Who brought you out of that? Is the Lord of the worlds who brought you out of your initial issues not able to take you out of other issues that you're going to face on earth? And do you really think that if you came out of one issue, Allah is not going to test you with another? It has to come. It's coming. Get ready for it. Subhanallah. Prepare for a rainy day. Connect with Allah. Be happy. One of the major problems that we have is we refuse to adjust to a new level that Allah might have kept us on that may not be as high materially as we were in the past. So because we're too proud to adjust, we suffer the consequences and we can't face the people. And we can't accept that I'm no longer as wealthy as I was. One of the gifts of Allah is to be able to adjust. You can't afford school fees at the top schools. Well, you know what? I can adjust. I might even consider homeschooling. Who knows? Maybe Allah wants you to take your kids out of that school for a reason. You might realize it later. So remember to thank Allah for what you have. Because the Quran clearly says that لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ I'm sure we all know this verse. If you are to thank Allah, Allah says, if you are thankful, I will grant you increase. That's what Allah says. If you are thankful, I will give you increase. If I want increase, what do I have to do? Wallahi, you have to thank Allah. That's the way to grant you increase. You have to thank Allah. And Allah will bless you with more and more and more. And how do you thank Allah? Again, you start off with your salah. You start off with your prayer. You start off with worshipping Allah alone. You try and ensure that all my ibadah is focused and dedicated to my maker. And at the same time, I'm following the sunnah to the best of my ability. The best of my ability. And then I'm kind to everyone. I fulfill their rights. I go out of my way to help people. I forgive a lot of those who've wronged me if you can't forgive all of them. A guy came to me a few weeks ago and says, I'm going for hajj. I said, hey, mashallah, mubarak, congrats, man. May Allah make hajj easy for all those who, who are there and those who are going. And may Allah take us all again. And those who haven't been, may Allah take us there. I said, yes, so mashallah. He said, no, I have a problem. What's the problem? He says, you know, I went asking forgiveness and I went to ask forgiveness from this guy that really I have wronged him in quite a big way in the past. He told me, I'm not forgiving you. But I'm going for hajj. He said, I'm not forgiving you. But I'm going for the pillar of Islam. Hajj. He said, so what? I'm not forgiving you. He said, now, can't you talk to him? I said, well, we can try talking to him. But he's well within his rights to say that I'm not forgiving you. Do you get my point? Why did you wrong him in the first place? This was a hard nut to crack. Subhanallah. He said, if you only knew what this guy did, I'm leaving it for the day of judgment. That's why Allah Almighty says, be careful. When you've committed a sin between yourself and Allah, it's easily forgiven. When you've committed a sin against a fellow human being, it's a bit tougher because fellow human beings are not ghafoor and rahim. They're not most forgiving, most merciful. No, they are human beings. They look at you like this. Subhanallah, you, I'll fix you. <laughs> and you look at him and you say, you're so small, come fix me now. He says, no, not now. We're waiting for the day of judgment. Oh, that's a heavy one. So I had to speak to this brother and I told him, my brother, I want to just tell you one thing, a point of consideration. Say you arrive on the day of judgment and this guy comes along and say, oh Allah, I, I, I want justice. What if something happened somehow and the tables happen to turn and the evidence is against you and on that particular day you find out that you were actually guilty of something and you had to actually pay him and now it's the other way around. Is it possible? Initially he said, no, it's not possible. He did wrong to me. I said, but... Haven't you spoken about him and done this and done that and so on? I said, yeah, I spent half a life against this guy. I said, there you are. The best thing to do is don't leave it for the day of judgment. Just release it. Three days later, he came to me and said, I've released it. Subhanallah.
Subhanallah. He said, I thought about what you said. It's not worth holding it. It's worldly. Release it. The other day I was telling some of the brothers, I said, you know what? If someone's caused, if someone's caused harm to me, I really don't care. And I wouldn't waste my time praying against them because I need my prayers. You know, I, I'm going to pray for good things, nice things that I want. I can't waste my time. Oh, Allah, destroy this man and that man. I can't do that. He said, you know, leave it. When it gets to 10 million US dollars, I'll think about it. <laughs> but nine and a half million, it's still a bit cheap. Why should I raise my hands? Come on. I'm going to raise my hands and you haven't even caused destruction of nine and a half million to me. I said, leave it, man. Mind you, I rather say, oh, Allah, give me Jannah, forgive me. Grant me the companionship of Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa I mean, come on, those are du'as now. Come on, now you're talking business, man. Subhanallah, I'm going to talk about you. I'd rather say, oh Allah, let this man be my neighbor there. And let's not have ghil and any form of ill feeling in our hearts. And we're all going to be together there. Subhanallah, we'll be enjoying. I tell Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, when in du'a, that oh Allah, even if you give me a small, the smallest spot in Jannah, wallahi, I'll be happy. The small, we all, shouldn't we all, Want at least a little spot. If I got my small corner right at the entrance, Wallahi, I'm a happy man. I'm a happy man. May Allah grant it to us through His mercy. No matter how many deeds we do. Do you know why we do deeds? Let me explain why we do deeds. Because people hear always and correctly that you can never enter Jannah through your deeds. You can only enter Jannah and paradise through the mercy of Allah. Have you ever heard that? It's a fact. It's in the hadith. So then why do we do deeds? Isn't it? You know, young people today are too sharp. Say, I, I don't do salah, I don't do anything because I heard that we enter Jannah through the mercy of Allah, not through our deeds. Why should I waste my time doing deeds? Hang on, hang on, hang on. You enter Jannah through the mercy of Allah. How do you invoke the mercy of Allah through your deeds? Did you hear that? How do you get the mercy of Allah? Well, you do deeds. So I can't enter paradise through my deeds, but I can get the mercy of Allah through my deeds. And then I'll enter paradise through the mercy of Allah. Do you know why? Today we all did our salah, right? Let me tell you what happened today. So the imam came up and we were all squeezing. Some were outside, some couldn't make it. Right now people are standing here. They, the sisters, one wonders where they are. I think we're in Panorama and they might be in Cape Town. But in actual, in, in actual fact, we are human. So as you're standing, one guy is pushing you this way, that way, you're looking at the spot for sujood. Wallahi, when I was in sujood earlier as an imam, I got up slightly quicker because I thought to myself, there may be people struggling to make sujood because of how narrow the space was. I'm telling you a fact. And so, in reality, when we are standing, how's the concentration levels? How were they today? Tell me. You're standing and you're thinking, Surat al we're listening to this recitation. You know, I stopped at a certain place and I, went and, and I continued. And I thought to myself, well, it would have been better meaning-wise to not have actually continued there to go back a bit. But I said, no, it's okay. It's not a mistake. And all these things are going through my mind. But it's to do with Quran, right? It's okay. Hey, the concentration was nowhere near 100% for any one of us. Some of the guys being pushed and this guy next to you is stamping on your toes and you're saying, come on, man. Where's the concentration? The fact that you did your salah will call on and invoke the mercy of Allah. When Allah has mercy upon you, he will accept the salah and give you paradise through his mercy. That's what it was. So did you try? I did. Sometimes people have OCD. They can't, they just can't do things. You might make wudu 50 times from 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock and you're just repeating, you're washing and doing. You know what you need to know? The fact that you tried already invokes the mercy of Allah and he's already accepted you your wudu and your salah that's it you do your best and move on because you're a human sometimes people ask me no, I went to the loo and I tried to wash and wash and wash I said you don't need to repeat that word thrice just say I tried to wash that's all <laughs> it's like when we were young we used to say hey that ride was long I say the number of O's you've added there make the journey even further. <laughs> you just needed to say it was long and that's it. People know it was long. That's it. But we have a habit. I wash and wash and wash. And wash. That means I washed a lot. So it is a matter that affects a lot of people to be honest with you. What you need to know is Allah Almighty does not benefit from your wudu. Rather you benefit from your wudu to the degree that sometimes you haven't even cleansed with water at all. And Allah allows you to use sand or a stone or tayammum which is dust dust that we consider 
dirty is technically or properly clean in order to cleanse you and, and you're actually putting dust and you, you're clean because there was no water, that shows you that Allah didn't actually need that. Allah just wants you to follow instructions to the best of your ability and believe that he's going to accept it from me as a human even though I might have made a little bit of a blunder here and there. It's okay. Did you try your best? Yes, move on. Don't look back. That's why when you finish your salah and you're walking out, then you start doubting. What did I do? Hey, it's too late. You walked out and you're gone. Rabbana taqabbal minna. May Allah accept it from us. You already invoked the mercy of Allah. The fact that you got up for salah and you fulfilled the salah, even with a few blunders here and there. I'm talking of minor things, inshallah. But it's accepted. It's accepted by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we enter Jannah through the mercy of Allah and we get the mercy of Allah through fulfilling our acts of worship. May Allah grant us that mercy. Amen. So when Allah has allowed you to worship him in a beautiful way, Wallahi, he gives you the understanding of what the meaning of the best of this world is. There's no point in saying, Allah, give me the best of this world and you don't know what's the best of this world. You're aiming somewhere else. And as for the hereafter, my brothers, my sisters, we are believers. We are holders and bearers of the shahada, la ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That statement has such a value in the eyes of Allah that he tells us through the blessed lips of Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that if that statement is to be put on one side of the scale and on the other side of the scale, 99 files filled with sin, each file as big as from the east to the west, still that shahada is heavier than all those 99 files. Have hope in the mercy of Allah. That doesn't mean you must... Do that which is wrong and say, I, I heard Allah is merciful. Don't worry, we'll just drink tonight and it's okay. Uh, no, not at all. I hope it's water. <laughs> yes. I told one brother, I said, my man, you're getting married. He says, yes. I said, Allah bless you. I have one, one piece of advice. I said, make sure everything is pleasing to Allah. That's going to happen today. He said, but it's hard. I said, why? He said, you know, the women want to wear a shortcut and this, that, and you know, showing the cleavage and showing this and that and everything tight. I said, you don't need to be interested in the women. But you can let them know that, look, there's a dress code. Wallahi, when you go to a nightclub sometimes, they tell you dress code. Am I right or wrong? Not like I've been, but I've seen the adverts. <laughs> I've seen the adverts. They say dress code, strictly this and strictly that. <laughs> You go to some restaurants to eat and they tell you strictly bow tie and whatever. Am I right or wrong? Can't you say strictly this? It's my wedding. Come on, it's a day of celebration of half of my faith. So he says, no, it's, it's difficult. I said, why? Well, he said, you know, these youngsters, they also, some of them, they smoke weed and all of that. You know, I said, that becomes a weeding. It's not a wedding anymore. <laughs> it's a weeding. But so much happens on a day that Allah's given you that is blessed. Let's go back to what I said earlier. You only achieve and receive happiness and true joy when you have sacrificed. Eid al-Adha. Those two words are actually opposite poles if you look at them. The, 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 the joy, the happiness of sacrifice. You're going to get that happiness in the dunya and the akhirah and this world and the next. Do your best. Don't plan to sin hoping that Allah is mercy, merciful. But when you've wronged, when you did something wrong, don't let shaitan make you despondent. Are you alive? Yes. Are you breathing? Yes. Is your heart pumping? Yes. Subhanallah. If that's the case, there's hope for you. Islam is based on the mercy of Allah and forgiveness. Allah loves to forgive. Allahumma innaka afuun tu hibbul afwa fa'fu anni. Oh Allah, you are forgiving. You love to forgive. So forgive me. He loves to forgive. You go to a man asking him for 10 rands and you heard this guy loves to give. You really think he's going to give you 10 rands? He's going to give you a hundred, maybe more, maybe a thousand. He's going to give you as much. Imagine when you heard and you know and you believe and you're convinced that Allah loves to forgive. Can you ever lose hope in the mercy of Allah? I am convinced for one and I ask Allah to grant us death upon Iman. When you have died upon Iman, I'm convinced that we will all be going to an absolutely amazing place superb the best of the next life is awaiting the best of it when you see it you're going to forget about this world 
Nothing that you ever came across in terms of material items on earth will follow you there. It doesn't qualify. Because the hadith says, مَا لَا عَيْنٌ رَأَتْ وَلَا أُذُنٌ سَمِعَتْ وَلَا خَطَرَ عَلَى قَلْبِ بَشَرْ In Jannah, there is that which no eyes have seen, no ears have heard, and it hasn't even crossed the heart of an individual, meaning you haven't even thought about it. So I'm waiting to get there. Because I know I existed in another form earlier. Prior to me being in the womb of my mother and in the womb of my mother, I can't remember a thing, even in the womb of your mother. So if people say, where were you before you were born? Five years before you were born. The answer is, I was with my maker, with Allah. I don't know, I can't remember. So then they argue to say, well, if you can't remember, you were nowhere. Well, I can't remember when I was in the womb either, so was I still nowhere? You see, common logic, isn't it? Then they'll tell you, no, but that we saw you with a scan, isn't it? How many billions of people passed on without knowing what a scan was all about when technology didn't exist? Didn't they say, well, you didn't exist because you know what? Do you remember? No, I don't. So not everything will my brain be able to process in a proper way. So if I were to tell you, listen, you and I are so sophisticated. Imagine all of us have made an effort, including myself, to be here tonight. We've all made an effort to be here. May Allah accept it from us. You've made an effort to be here. I see you. I love you. I feel for you. We have a connection with each other. We want to talk. We may want to meet. Is it humanly possible to spend a minute with everyone? It's not. So I want to be with you. I'm going to have to wait for a day. We are so sophisticated that Allah Almighty can never ever let us just perish. And we're gone into thin air. Where did you go? Gone. Wallahi, when I was young, I remember we, we passed by somebody's house. We were walking to school. And there was a funeral, people of another faith. And there were two pigeons, or pigeons, yes, sitting on the roof. And these two aunties were walking out saying, hey, that's her. <laughs> I'm thinking, that's her? I mean, that's who? That's her. So fortunate. So it took us time to process what was being said. It took us time to process what was being said. You know, as much as we respect human beings, but our belief is different. We believe you pass on, your soul goes into the barzakh. The barzakh is a unique place. Only what the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam has told us would we be able to know. We don't know more details. But when we go there, trust me, it's going to be beautiful. We are told that when a believer passes on, a good believer passes on, Say you pass away today, yesterday, whenever it was, tomorrow. The time between now and the day of judgment is crumpled. It's like a flash. It passes like no time. And before you know it, you're there. The example of the sleep of a human is perhaps the closest way of explanation. Two guys are trying to sleep. One falls off to sleep and the other one cannot sleep. They're both next to each other. The one who fell off to sleep, in a second, you have to wake him up. Hey, it's Fajr. It's already Fajr. Hey, it felt like one second. Am I right? I was still dreaming. And I still wanted the goodness. <laughs> it reminds me of the goodness. They say there was a guy being offered two flakes in his sleep. And he was debating with the guy, no, I need four flakes. He says, no, I only have two. I can give you two. I need four flakes. I only Imagine flakes. What's a flake? His eye opened, he realized it was a dream. He quickly closed it, okay, just give me the two. <laughs> so in reality, if someone is sleeping next to you, you don't even have a clue how many flakes they're eating. <laughs> it's the healthiest food because you get up in the morning and there's nothing happened, right? No, no calories, no nothing to burn because it was just a dream. But... For the man who was awake, the night was long and he couldn't sleep and tossing and turning and perhaps flicking an internet and whatever else it might have been. It was a long night. Similarly, but obviously a higher example, in the barzakh, a believer doesn't feel the time. Before you know it, it's already. That's why don't worry about your loved ones who passed on with Iman. May Allah grant us and them Jannah. And I tell you, we'll meet with them. For them, it's quick. 
But now we've got to prepare for the day we go. I want to end with one more very, very important factor. When someone passes away, what do we do? So we make dua for them, which is probably one of the most powerful gifts you can give them. Repetition of Allahumma ghfir lahu, warhamhu, wa sakinhu fil jannah. Oh Allah, forgive them, have mercy on them, and grant them jannah. Him or her or them, collectively, whatever it may be. Powerful dua. We may pay their debts, we may give a charity on their behalf, we may read some Quran, do some forms of ibadah, and we're hoping that the reward will reach them by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But, if you go to the hadith, of the Prophet ﷺ, he says when a person passes on, all his deeds are cut besides three things. And then he mentions these three. He says, Sadaqatun Jariya, right? A charity that he gave in his life or she gave in her life, the reward of which outlives them. The benefit of that outlives them. You, it was a tree or a borehole or something or not, whatever else it may be, a charity. But who gave it? You gave it when you were alive. That's going to help you. Right? Secondly, ilmun yuntafa'u bih. Knowledge that that person taught, that others benefited from. The original hadith is speaking about the person having done these deeds while he or she was alive before he or she passed away and then these deeds are benefiting them and the third one is a child that you invested in so well that they, the child made dua or makes dua and supplication for you after you've passed on that is amazing so you took the time to spend with your family, your children, you invested in them, you actually taught them, you were there for them to the best of your ability. And you brought them up in a beautiful way by the help of Allah. When you passed on, they continued to make dua for you. What a big blessing. So what I want to say is, there are two things. What is more powerful is for you to have done it in your life. We drill boreholes on behalf of that deceased. We build a masjid on behalf of that deceased. While that is in its place, what is far more beneficial is let me drill a borehole for myself. Me. I'm going to drill a borehole. Whose name? My name, inshallah. Bismillah. That's a masjid I'm building, inshallah, for my own benefit. And I'll put another one up, inshallah, on the benefit of the others. But something I'm going to do myself. Why should we wait? to die before others can do all of that when what is more powerful is the fact that you did it yourself i'm not belittling what you might do for those who've passed on from your family no that's okay you may do and there is a scope of doing you find out from the scholars and you can do but all i'm telling you is i'm trying to just highlight what is much more powerful and allah almighty will bless you may allah grant us the goodness of this world and the next i wanted to speak for 45 minutes but I had a panoramic view. <laughs> so we stretched it a few degrees this way and that way and we ended up speaking for exactly one hour. May Allah grant us the best of this world and the next. May Allah forgive us, strengthen us with our prayers, salah, with our dress code, with our truthfulness, with our uprightness. May Allah make us happy the way He's created us because today people are challenging Allah regarding how He created us. The biggest liberation today is to be satisfied with the way Allah has made you. You are totally liberated. You are truly free from the clutches of any and everything negative. May Allah Almighty bless all of us and protect us. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallama wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We say jazakumullah khairan to our honorable Mufti, mashaAllah, who has inspired us once again. And I just want to make a few announcements. Mufti has another appointment. So inshallah ta'ala, if we can, just as Mufti has spoken about Rahmah, we have some Rahmah with Mufti now. Mufti has some Rahmah with us. Spoke for longer than 45 minutes, alhamdulillah. But Mufti needs to be at another place, inshallah ta'ala. So we ask if we can just make way for Mufti, inshallah ta'ala, immediately for Mufti to leave. But it has come to my attention that there are some cars that is blocking the way. So Mufti also need to get out with his car, inshallah ta'ala. And uh, before Mufti leave, we, on behalf of the Panorama community, would like to give Mufti, inshallah, a gift. So if Mufti can just, inshallah, everybody, Mufti sab, inshallah, just a gift from the panorama. We are really honored.
Jazakumullah khair for this wonderful gift. MashaAllah. I have a small request. If we can just make a little bit of a line while I'm walking out, I'll shake hands. We won't hug and kiss, inshallah. We'll leave that, inshallah, for Jannah. But by the will of Allah, if I, I don't mind shaking hands on my way out, let's try not to stampede. And inshallah, we'll try and uh, accommodate as many people as possible. If you want to take any photos, don't stop me. You can take it while we're walking, inshallah, but don't stop me for it. No one's going to stop you from taking the picture, but at least don't stop us, inshallah. Barakallah feekum. Please honor Mufti's request, Min Fadlik. Jazakum Allah khairan. Salaam wa barakatuh.